One day, I was browsing the deep web, and like when you drive to a destination and you don't really fully remember driving there, I didn't know quite how I ended up where I did, but I found myself in this online marketplace. However, this wasn't like your standard Walmart. This market was infamous for selling items that were supposedly cursed. Objects that may as well have come straight off the pages of a Stephen King novel. Well, curiosity got the better of me. I thought it might be a great idea for a YouTube video. The unboxing of a supposed cursed object was a viral video waiting to happen, surely? I didn't think twice I hit the purchase button and then sat back and waited for my item to arrive. Hey race where things get a little interesting, soon after the package arrived strange things started to happen, to be honest nothing instant or paranormal but small subtle occurrences, the kind of thing that has you thinking you're going crazy. Cupboards doors left open, doors left unlocked, thought you put your keys by the front door and now they're on the floor in the living room. Don't remember turning the hallway light on before bed? I started to hear whispers late at night, so quiet it could have been a dream. During the day it would feel like someone was just always right behind me, but I'd turn around and obviously there would be no one there, but that feeling had the hairs on the back of my neck standing up. I only escalated from there, soon after the nightmare started. I would wake drenched in sweat and panting like I'd ran a marathon, my mind would be confused and frightened until I realized I was safe in the confines of my bed, I'd calm myself down saying it was only a dream. Only a dream, but I would close my eyes and the faces, the hideous faces I would see, it was as if they were just waiting for me to go back to sleep. This may come as no surprise, but I am regretting the decision to ever buy anything from that marketplace. I have witnessed YouTubers open boxes like this from the deep web and I took it all as foolery. I wish I could turn back the clock and stop myself from every pressing purchase. The voices get louder and more often with every passing day now giving me headaches that not even painkillers can get rid of. I try to take the object from my house to get rid, but something always stops me at the threshold, a power holding me in place. I can only compare it to sleep paralysis. You know you can move and want to move, but you just can't. As the pressure builds in my head, I'm forced to set it back down again and walk away, the faces visible behind every blink. If you take anything from this story, please learn from my mistake. If there is something recommended to stay away from, stay away from it. I wanted an easy viral video. Instead, my mind is broken. My body betrays me, making me think and feel things. There is nothing for the pain and am embarrassed to ask for help. I've spent the better part of a decade as a cybersecurity analyst for Trident Cybersecurity, or TCS for short. A highly regarded private agency whose name is whispered across government halls and boardrooms. Our client list ranges from powerful conglomerates and discreet billionaires to governmental bodies looking for invisible defense lines in the current digital hellscape. Over the years, I've worked on a myriad of complex cases. I helped take down an international ring of hackers intent on disrupting the national power grid. I've unearthed digital scams hidden in the most intricate labyrinth of code. My work with Trident led to the arrests of some very dangerous people you will never hear of who have eluded international authorities for years. I am naturally an introvert, preferring the company of a glowing screen and encrypted data to people. My colleagues often joked that I could talk to computers. If patience, diligence, and an uncanny ability to find patterns in chaos are characteristics you'd attribute to a conversation with computers, they might have been right. When I was handed the case file labeled Deep Web Anomalies, I rolled my eyes. I had seen a hundred similar files to authorities who can afford our services scared of the Deep Web's reputation, thinking every glitch or system hiccup was some malicious entity or person from the darker corners of the internet. However, it's either just them unable to explain an online behavior and getting spooked, or someone hitting sites at random to test vulnerabilities or just cause chaos for fun. Just another day at the office, I thought, ready to explain away the smoke and mirrors surrounding whatever tricks they were seeing. As I began the investigation, I traced the incidents to an obscure message board, a niche digital hotspot where internet users exchanged experiences and data about purported paranormal events. The board was a melting pot of the uncanny and unexplainable. 
Their stories ranged from inexplicable system crashes and strange apparitions on video calls to personal accounts of spectral whispers through headphones. Even some were claiming their AI personal assistants had started speaking in tongues. Just imagine Slash X Slash on steroids. This board, however, was more than just the usual conspiracy theories. The sheer number of incidents, their sporadic nature, the detailed accounts of tech-savvy users failing to find an earthly explanation, it made me pause, a flicker of unease threading through me. The paranormal has always been an interesting, albeit abstract, concept to me. I'm not dismissive of it, but I've always found comfort in the logical, the explainable. While sifting through the digital chaos, a particular thread titled The Shadow Codex piqued my interest. A thread teeming with frantic narratives and vague cautionary tales penned by a user named Cortex Phantom. Among the clutter of posts, one stood out a cryptic, encrypted file ominously titled Demon's Whisper. I've encountered countless clandestine files during my tenure, each hiding keys to the locks of my investigations. The Demon's Whisper seemed like it could be one such key, maybe an encoded message or a hidden breadcrumb to lead me to the source of these anomalies. I let out a low sigh as I stared at the encrypted file. Downloading files from unknown sources was never without risks. It always set off a quiet alarm in the back of my mind, reminding me of the potential digital landmines I could be walking into. But as part of my job, I had learned to weigh the risks against the potential rewards. The careful dance of curiosity and caution was a familiar one. I remembered a case from a few years back where a similarly obscure file led me to a worm that had been slowly eating away at a corporation's security infrastructure. Despite the inherent risks, my foray into the digital unknown had been vindicated. I decided to take the plunge, encased within my virtual machine, a fortress of firewalls and isolated sandboxes. With a series of deft keystrokes, I set all my security options to the highest, prepping for potential digital fallout. Each click closer to the download felt like a step deeper into an unexplored cave. At that moment, I believed I was simply unearthing another piece of this complex puzzle. I thought that Demon's Whisper would be another mysterious yet manageable obstacle. But I was wrong. As the decryption software did its job, the file unraveled not into a clue to my perpetrator, but into a haunting phrase that would soon seep into every corner of my reality, Shadow Dwells Within. It was far from the solution I had anticipated. I devoted the next few hours to examining Demon's Whisper. My screen illuminated the room as I traced through the intricate web of code, dissecting each line twice over. At the surface, it was a complex yet seemingly harmless array of encrypted data. As I delved deeper, peculiarities emerged recurring snippets of nonsensical data, obfuscated commands, sequences that seemed to replicate themselves in a bizarrely organic fashion. Despite the oddities, I couldn't pinpoint any concrete threats or leads. The file was just a maze of riddles layered with digital noise. Frustrated, I concluded it was simply a cleverly designed decoy to mislead curious minds like mine. Unresolved mysteries have a way of gnawing at your psyche. As fascinating as the file was, I knew keeping such an unpredictable element in my system was unwise. As I hovered the mouse over the delete button, I was momentarily frozen by a fleeting sense of disappointment. All that build up for a dead end. With a reluctant sigh, I clicked delete. A strange sensation washed over me as the file vanished from my drive. The room seemed colder, the hum of my computer louder. I shrugged it off, attributing it to the late hour and the eye strain. But then my screen flickered, displaying what looked like snippets of the same code from the deleted file. A cold dread prickled at the back of my neck. I frantically ran a system diagnostics check, but it came back clean. The screen returned to normal as abruptly as it had glitched. Then, in the eerie silence, my speakers crackled to life, whispering a distorted echo of a phrase from the file, Shadow Dwells Within. My heart pounded as the words lingered in the air, a sinister serenade that threatened to shatter my composed demeanor. I swiftly muted the speakers, staring at the now silent machine in disbelief. A chill swept over me as if the room itself had taken a deep, cold breath. I sat there in the computer screen's glow, fear creeping into my veins. I could rationalize system glitches, but this? 
It was as if the digital entity had manifested itself in my very workspace. I simply made myself believe it was a coincidence or a trick of my mind scaring itself. I had dismissed the claims of the paranormally inclined users on the message board, but now, I was the one sitting in a dark room, feeling the tendrils of the inexplicable encroach upon my reality. I was afraid, confused, and in deep waters that my knowledge of code and cyberspace hadn't prepared me for. The sun of a new day brought no respite. Strange occurrences now followed me beyond the confines of my workspace. Digital devices I owned began acting oddly. My smartphone screen sometimes flickers, showing glimpses of the same strange code I had encountered. My smartwatch would vibrate randomly, displaying nonsensical strings of data instead of the time. Even my smart home system seemed to be in the grip of this digital haunting, the thermostat fluctuating wildly, lights flickering on and off at their own accord. At first, I tried to rationalize it. Perhaps it was a newly made worm or virus that had made its way through my devices, new enough to bypass all my current era security. But the nature of these disturbances felt less like malicious software and more like a presence. The digital world had been my playground for years, but now it felt tainted and hostile. The familiar hum of my computer was now a haunting reminder of the inexplicable. The boundary between my professional and private life began to blur, replaced with a mounting dread that made my home feel alien and unfamiliar. To my growing horror, these occurrences became more frequent, more intrusive. More distorted whispers would echo from my speakers, the chilling phrase shadow dwells within now a regular, unwelcome intrusion. I would find my computer on in the middle of the night, the screen pulsating with the eerie glow of that nonsensical code. Sleep became a luxury, each waking moment dominated by an oppressive sense of unease. My eyes would dart to each digital display, anticipating the next bizarre occurrence. Anxiety clawed at me, replacing the analytical calm of my professional persona with a man living on a razor's edge of fear. But as disturbing as the developments were, a part of me remained stubbornly defiant. I refused to be intimidated by what seemed like a digital poltergeist. Driven by a mix of fear and determination, I decided to dive back into the murky depths of the Shadow Codex. The thread was still there, exactly where I found it. Equipped with a new resolve, I meticulously gathered every information I had, cryptic message and anomaly. Each clue was a lifeline back into the digital abyss, a breadcrumb on the path to my unseen tormentor. On the message board, Cortex Phantom's posts took a more ominous tone. Rereading them felt like descending into a dark well, the words a spiral into madness. The thread was a digital relic, a testament to the silent chaos that the Codex had apparently unleashed on others before me. When I first re-encountered the haunting phrase, Shadow Dwells Within, my blood ran cold. But fear was now my fuel. With each repetition of the phrase, I felt less like a victim and more like a hunter closing in on his prey. Hours turned into days, each instance of the phenomenon pushing me further down the rabbit hole. It was a battle of attrition, me against the abstract horror lurking in the depths of cyberspace. The Shadow Codex was an enigma, a digital wraith that defied definition. As the lines between my work and the creeping terror blurred, so did the boundary between my mind and the digital. I started seeing the haunting code in my dreams, the patterns weaving themselves into the fabric of my nightmares. Every digital flicker, distorted whisper, and chilling message were all signposts to my slowly eroding sanity. By the end of the week, I was a shadow of my former self. My once pristine workspace was now a storm-ravaged landscape of discarded coffee cups and scattered notes. My reflection in the dark screen was a haggard, haunted face, eyes wide with a terror that had become my constant companion. I was adrift in a sea of digital horror, a lone sailor battling a storm that defied understanding. The code was no longer just an anomaly in the digital realm, it was an eldritch entity, a relentless force slowly corroding my reality's edges. The seemingly random sequences started to make a twisted kind of sense in my subconscious, forming a grotesque pattern that invaded my every thought, yet when I tried to formulate these thoughts, they would quickly lose sense. It was like knowing the definition of a word, but not being able to name it. The Codex was reaching out from the digital realm into my mind, reshaping my sanity into its own terrifying image. 
As the toll of my descent into the Codex became increasingly tangible, the once familiar digital landscape had transformed into an abstract nightmare. The culmination of the horror was not just the code, but the creeping realization of my own insignificance, my inability to comprehend the depth of the abyss I had stumbled into. I was losing myself, piece by piece, my sanity slowly succumbing to the darkness of the pits I was delving into. By the time I looked away from the screen, my surroundings were painted with the echo of the horrific code. I was now a prisoner in my own home, the walls whispering the chilling chorus, shadow dwells within. As I descended into a darkness that was both digital and psychological, one thing was clear that the shadow codex wasn't just dwelling within my machines. It was in my mind. It had become a part of me. Each day, my reality became a hellscape of twisted code and creeping shadows. The codex dominated every waking moment, the anomaly that was now a leviathan consuming my life. My mind felt like a battleground, a storm-tossed sea in the grip of a monstrous entity. Driven by desperation, I threw myself into my work, hoping to find a solution, a way to rid the codex from my reality. I spent countless hours poring over every line of code, every fragment of the bizarre sequences, trying to discern some pattern, some key that could unlock the nightmare I was trapped in. But every attempt to decipher the codex was met with failure. It was like trying to comprehend a language from a long-dead civilization, its meanings obscured by the sands of time and the vast void of cyberspace. The more I tried to decipher it, the more my mind was consumed by its eldritch patterns. Sleep became a forgotten luxury. My meals were consumed in front of my screen, my appetite overtaken by a hunger for answers. Every personal boundary, every sanity-preserving routine was lost in the wake of the Codex. Even the simple act of leaving my workspace filled me with dread. Every time I stepped away from my computer, I was assaulted by the echoes of the Codex. My once safe haven was gone. Each failed attempt to wrest control from the Codex only deepened the darkness swallowing my reality. Yet, paradoxically, the closer I inched towards madness, the more determined I became. A part of me clung to the belief that I could make it to the other end of the tunnel, that this was my way to fight back. It was a beacon of hope in a sea of despair, a desperate lifeline in the face of ever-encroaching darkness. But with every failed attempt, the Codex's grip on my reality tightened. My mind was now a maelstrom of digital horrors, my sanity reduced to a fragile thread dangling over an abyss of madness. I was caught in a perverse dance with the Codex, each step dragging me deeper into its shadowy realm. The boundary between my mind and the Codex was becoming increasingly blurred, my thoughts echoing with its haunting patterns. My once rational mind was now an echo chamber of a monstrous entity, my sanity slowly being eroded by the ceaseless whisper. It was no longer just a digital anomaly, it was my reality, my nightmare, my inescapable fate. In a desperate bid for sanity, I finally decided to do the unthinkable disconnect from the digital world. I switched off my computer, my smartphone, and every device that linked me online. The hum of the technology, once a comforting presence, now sounded like the ominous drone of some unseen beast. The silence that followed felt like a gasp of fresh air after being submerged in a dark, turbulent ocean. But my respite was short-lived. Even devoid of the digital manifestations, the Codex's influence was not gone. The silence was not the comforting void I had hoped for, but a stark, cold reminder of my isolation. My home, once my sanctuary, was now a prison of silence and shadows. Without the hum of the machines, every creak of the house and every rustle of the wind outside seemed amplified. My mind, so used to the digital chatter, now started playing tricks on me. I saw patterns in the grain of the wooden floor and the plaster on the walls. The ordinary and mundane were twisted into grotesque reminders of the Codex. The physical world was not a refuge, it was just another canvas for the Codex to paint its horrors on. Shadow dwells within, the phrase had followed me out of the digital world, insinuating itself into the very fabric of my existence. The patterns in the wood, the whispers of the wind, and the play of shadows in the corners of my vision all echoed the haunting mantra. As the sun set, casting long, menacing shadows around the room, I missed the computer screen's eerie glow. The real world was no less terrifying than the digital. 
Each shadow seemed to pulse with a life of its own as if the codex had extended its reach from the digital realm into the physical. The darkness around me seemed to throb with an unseen presence, the codex perhaps, lingering at the edges of my perception. The creeping sense of horror was more profound and more intimate in the real world. It was no longer a threat lurking behind a screen, but an all-encompassing entity that had spilt into every corner of my existence. In the depth of my despair, I reached out to the only place that seemed to hold any semblance of understanding to the message board where it all began. With trembling hands and a mind teetering on the brink of insanity, I reconnected to the digital world, back to the humming chorus of machines and the eerie glow of the screen. The fear was tangible, but my desperation pushed me past it. A grim sense of nostalgia washed over me as the familiar form loaded on the screen. This was where my nightmare had started, and maybe, just maybe, where it could end. I poured out my story, every detail of my encounter with the Codex, the bizarre happenings, my subsequent isolation, and the profound terror that now consumed my life. The words came out in a disjointed, chaotic stream, a madman's rambling to the void. I didn't sugarcoat my fear, didn't hold back my despair. I was beyond caring about sounding crazy or desperate. If anyone could understand, maybe offer some insight or help, it would be these fellow dwellers of the digital shadows. And then I waited, every passing second stretching into an agonizing eternity. I stared at the screen, the harsh light stinging my eyes, the silence of the room amplifying the pounding of my heart. I waited for a reply, any reply, a lifeline in the endless digital sea. The notification ping startled me, breaking the oppressive silence. My heart pounded in my chest as I opened the response. Two words stared back at me, their brevity more chilling than any verbose response. Too late. A chill ran down my spine, the finality of the words echoing in my mind. It was like a death sentence, the crushing weight of my doomed fate. They held no sympathy, no offer of help, just a cold, hard acknowledgement of my plight. I was truly alone, left to face the monstrous codex and its terrifying grip on my reality. A sense of profound dread washed over me. This wasn't just a fight against a digital anomaly anymore. This was a battle for my sanity, my very existence, against an entity that had already claimed victory. The codex wasn't just in my computer or my home. It was in me. And according to someone who managed to look past my ramblings as insane gibberish, it was already too late. As the days bled into each other, my life became a relentless cycle of dread and despair. The Codex's haunting echo never left me, persisting in my every thought and sense. I was trapped, lost within my own mind, and there was no way out. Each sunrise was not a new day, but another descent into madness. I stopped trying to track time. Days, hours, minutes, they lost their meaning in the face of the all-consuming horror. Food lost its taste, sleep became a fleeting memory, and my once-cherished solitude became a tormenting isolation. Each day was a test of endurance, a struggle to hold on to the last vestiges of my sanity. The house seemed to take on a life of its own, the walls whispering with the echoes of the codex. It was no longer a haven, but a haunting reminder of my entrapment. I could see the codex's patterns in everything the way the dust particles floated in the sunbeams, the way the shadows played on the walls. It was as if the codex had woven itself into the very fabric of reality. I was living in its shadow, my life a twisted reflection of its nightmarish design. I started to fear sleep, knowing that it would only bring more terrifying visions. But staying awake was no better, every waking moment was filled with the creeping horror of the codex. The outside world became a distant memory. I couldn't remember the last time I had left the house, seen another human face, heard a voice other than my own. The Codex had effectively isolated me, cutting me off from the world, my life reduced to a terrifying echo of the digital nightmare. My once robust spirit was breaking, my will eroding under the ceaseless onslaught of the Codex. The shadows grew darker, the silence more oppressive, and my despair deeper. I was losing myself, my identity being swallowed by the monstrous entity. I could no longer tell where I ended and the codex began. Its patterns had etched themselves into my thoughts, its influence seeping into every corner of my mind. I was not just a victim of the codex, I was becoming a part of it. 
and in the cold, heartless world it had created, I was utterly alone. And the worst part? The silence, the isolation, the creeping terror, they weren't the result of some demonic entity or a malevolent ghost. They were the product of my own making, the consequence of my journey into the abyss. Shadow dwells within, the phrase had become a cruel prophecy, a chilling truth that was impossible to deny. Through lucid moments of clarity, I kept digging. My mind clawing from the deep depths it had sank. I am a digital spelunker lost in the abysmal depths of the Shadow Codex, its endless chasm drawing me in with an irresistible pull. However, the more I tried to understand it and decipher its language's cryptic patterns, the more I was consumed by it. Despite this, the pulsating symbols on my computer screen had become my obsession. In a trance-like state, each moment, each hour, was consumed by the pursuit of comprehension, the tantalizing possibility of a breakthrough, despite where that'd leave me in the end. It could be salvation, or it could be my demise, it'd finally be an end regardless. I labored over intricate patterns woven through labyrinthine forums, drew and redrew cryptic symbols, seeking connections, finding none. Yet, with every pattern I unraveled, every theory I spun, and every code I broke, I found it harder to remember who I am. Memories of my life before the Codex, before this haunting dread, become as elusive as the solutions I was seeking. Faces and names blurred into obscurity, replaced by the mesmerizing patterns of the Codex. I was losing myself in this digital abyss, feeding the very beast I was trying to slay. Each deciphered code leads to another, a never-ending maze of horror, resisting understanding. And I realized the terrifying truth, my futile attempt to conquer the Codex wasn't a path to salvation, it was a death march into oblivion. I understand the full scope of the Codex's monstrous design with chilling clarity. This isn't a war I can win. With every step I took to fight back, I was simply sinking deeper into its clutches. And thus, I descend, not fighting, not resisting, just falling, falling into the endless, inky depths of the Shadow Codex's realm. The futility of it all was crushing, finding myself to be a pawn in a game I cannot understand, let alone win. And finally, my mind snapped. I fall into a rhythm, dance with insanity and the unknown. The message board becomes my canvas, my stage, my confessional. I spill secrets of another realm onto the page, ideas beyond comprehension, names that no human tongue has uttered, descriptions of entities so foreign, so otherworldly, they defy our reality. Alien landscapes that extend into endless twilight, creatures formed from impossibilities, names that ring with an ethereal echo each post is a chilling sonnet to the Codex, a testament to my fall. These aren't just symbols or coded messages, they are whispers from the abyss, confessions from the edge of sanity. Every time I hit refresh, my posts, my mad ramblings, they vanished, devoured by the digital void. Each disappearance echoes the ephemerality of my sanity. But it doesn't matter, I keep posting, and I keep pouring the madness onto the screen. I am driven not by hope of salvation, but a need to express, to expel the Codex's influence, even if only momentarily. Then, finally, I resurface. The madness, the chaotic symphony of incomprehensible thoughts, recedes like a storm passing. I find myself sitting in front of my computer screen, fingers poised over the keyboard, my last post an amalgamation of cryptic symbols and alien words displayed on the screen. I hit refresh. The post disappears, as it always does. But a familiar post catches my eye in the refreshed list of threads. The original thread of the Shadow Codex, the digital Pandora's box that began my descent into this never-ending nightmare. Compelled by a sense of dread, I click on it. There, highlighted in the dim light of my room, is a new comment on the thread. It's from the original poster, the unknown harbinger of my ordeal. The message is as simple as it is chilling. The codex has been updated. Whatever I did, it seems it's ready for the next person to download and add to the annals of their sacred texts. My name is Charlie. Here's a short background, not that it matters. I've never been much for the finer things in life. I've always been happy to put in the minimum effort into my life. I suppose that's why I've been a short order cook for the last five years. 
I'm not going to say where, that would make it too easy to identify. But let's just say it's one of those places that no one really goes to, they just end up there. As long as it's cooked, it's good enough. In my 36 years on this earth, I suppose my failings at work aren't that much of a surprise. I never really developed what one would call drive. Barely passed my way through high school and ended up at the junior college for a couple of semesters until they kicked me out for bad grades. But that was always okay for me. As long as I could put a roof over my head, basic food on the table, and pay for my internet, I was happy. As much of a disappointment I was to my family, see, I'm only really interested in one thing, and that's the internet. A basic job with minimum effort required frees up way more time and energy to pursue my one real passion. I suppose in a way that's where it went all wrong. And maybe, for that, a life of mediocrity, this is my punishment. I hope someone believes me. Maybe one of you can even help me. I don't know. I've never seen anything like this before. I don't know anyone who has. But if you can help me, please respond. I suppose I should start at the beginning. It's the internet that got me in trouble. Not the regular internet. Browse that as you will. Don't do dumb stuff like download viruses or fall for scams, but it's mostly safe. What got me in trouble is the dark web. Stay off the dark web. There is nothing for you there. You want to buy drugs? Find a real life dealer like a normal person. The dark web is a crapshoot for that anyway since Silk Road Gate. Best case scenario you'll end up scammed or traumatized if you're a normal person that is. Worst case scenario, you might end up like me. I don't know why I was so interested in it. Maybe because it reminded me of the wild, wild west internet days of the late 90s and early 2000s. I learned about the dark web from my friend Gail, God forever ago. Has to be pushing 10 years now. We were just a couple of dumb kids, laughing our asses off about how you could look at everything and anything, free and clear. No roadblocks for illegal content. My interest only grew from there. Me and Gail drifted. He's a normal person. He got one of those grown-up corporate jobs at some dumb firm. He doesn't have much time these days for a high school burnout. But for me, the dark web was like an addiction. I had to look. No matter what it was that was there. Like some sort of perverse fascination. I won't go into detail about all that's there. I'm sure you already know. If you don't, you can Google it. Let's just say it's home to all sorts of illegal contents and some fanatical ideologies. And I found it all so fascinating. Don't get me wrong. I was never interested in participating in the perverse market before me. I've never been in a red room. But I like to see what's out there, like some sort of modern-day psychosociologist. I've never had too many problems before, until now that is. I take all possible steps to be anonymous and try to be a ghost. Most users won't notice you if you don't interact. I still don't know what happened. Not really. I was just browsing like normal. Seeing what's out there. I came across this page as I was going down the rabbit hole. I don't know why it caught my eye, resistance.onion, but it was just a black background with a text box that popped up. It said, do you see us? Do you want to be us? I should have closed my browser. But no, of course not. There was a box for a response, and my smart ass self replied, no. Then a response popped up, resistance is futile. I laughed at that. Whoever made this site was clearly a Trekkie. Probably just some sort of joke site. I went to close my browser, deciding I'd had enough for the night. As I did, a bunch of scrolling text populated across the screen. I didn't know what the hell that was. It looked like one of those visual effects they'd use for hacking in the old school tech movies. You know, just random letters and numbers. Dumb. Whatever joke this was, it wasn't a very good one. So again, I went to close my browser, but I never did. I really don't know what happened. I must have zoned out or fallen asleep because the next thing I knew, I became aware of my surroundings, but at least an hour had passed. 
All the screen red was in. I'm not going to lie, I got totally freaked out and unplugged my computer. It could stay that way for the rest of the night. It was time I got myself to bed anyway for my crappy job in the morning. But sleep didn't come easy that night. I was seriously unsettled and I wasn't really sure why. Nothing bad had happened other than an obvious joke site. The fact that I zoned on it for so long seemed wrong though. The next morning I got up for work like normal and went in. I cooked up eggs, pancakes, whatever the masses wanted. My co-workers were looking at me funny though. Ed in particular. He was a pretty hardened kitchen vet and not much got under his skin. I'd finally had enough of his side glances. Dude what? I asked him. Stop talking about this cool new vegetable website I just have to check out. I'm not interested. You know I don't buy anything online. He growled at me in true Ed fashion. Ed, the hell are you talking about? Was he finally snapping from the decades of crappy kitchen jobs? Was he about to go postal on this place? Charlie, you keep talking about some kind of garlic website and how I've got to check it out. I don't know what a garlic website is, but I just buy stuff at Walmart like a normal person. I didn't know what the hell he was talking about. I hadn't said anything about a site. I would never, not to him anyway. Ed can barely read his email and God knows I didn't have the time or energy to explain the finer parts of the sites I visit to him. So I did what anyone would do and avoided the loan for the rest of the day. Hopefully he'll be normal by tomorrow. However, not that much later the manager called me into her office. Oh God, what kind of nonsense had Ed said to her? Charlie, I've gotten quite a few complaints from your co-workers that you won't stop talking about some sort of website. Now I don't know what you're trying to pull, but this is a place of business. I know that influencers and promoting is all the rage these days. But I just can't have that here. The whole kitchen and waitstaff has been distracted all day. Now you need to go home and get yourself together. Come back tomorrow ready to work. Her normally soft-spoken self commanded. I stared in disbelief at my manager Sharon. I'd never known the young woman to be unreasonable before. But how could she be listening to this hogwash? It just can't be true. But Sharon. Don't but Sharon me. She interrupted. I can't have this here. If a customer overheard and complained to the corporate, what would happen? That would reflect badly on all of us. Now, go home and get whatever this is out of your system. Nothing more to say, I suppose, so I walked off to clock out and on my way. At home, I turned my computer back on. Maybe I could unwind on the internet. The regular internet. I've had enough of the dark web for the moment. I booted up, all seemed well. I opened my browser and all of a sudden I heard the noise of many, many emails coming in. Great. What now? I opened my email from my browser bar and it looks like everyone in my contacts list just about had messaged me. I open a few and it's all messages like what the hell and this better be a joke. I looked at the chains, apparently I had sent a message to every single person in my contact list. Some sort of video. When I play it, it looks the same as the code scrawl that I watched last night on that dark web page. Freak, I had to have a computer virus. How could this happen? I was so careful. I spent the next several hours replying to the most important people that I was hacked and to not watch it. Unplugged my computer and sat there wondering what the hell was going on. I was going to have to get a new computer for sure. Hopefully I'd done enough damage control just now. I thought maybe I'd just watch some YouTube on my TV. Oh freak, though, I couldn't be sure using my internet at all would be safe. With that thought I unplugged my modem and router. I guess I was in for a long night of going to bed. Sleep didn't come any easier that night. In the morning I got ready for work again and went in. I was determined to say as little as possible to anyone and everyone. I thought I did well. But an hour into my shift my manager Sharon called me into her office again. You know Charlie, I thought you understood what I was telling you yesterday. 
Not only am I still getting complaints today, now it can't stop talking about this website of yours too. That's it, you're fired. She exclaimed at me. I was stunned to say the least. I didn't bother arguing. How do you argue with crazy people? So what could I do? I stormed out. As I was leaving Ed called after me, hey buddy, make sure you check out resistance.onion. It's so cool. You have to check it out. With that, my blood ran cold. There was definitely something very wrong. Ed would never get on the dark web by himself. He can barely work email. God, I hope this wasn't something originating from those email shenanigans I found yesterday. But then it dawned on me that I didn't even have Ed's email. I raced home and slammed the door behind me. Got out my cell phone and opened up the recorder. I recorded myself going on about my favorite movies. Just a sample. I played it back and heard myself start talking about some berated slashed, but abruptly that stopped and I started talking about that mother freaking dark website. How? How could I do that without even knowing? I took off. Got in my car and started driving. Ended up at some seedy motel. The whole way there, I heard my phone going off. Emails, texts, voicemails. Got myself a room. The clerk was staring me down the whole time. I obviously got the point across that I wanted a room, but God knows what else I said. I sat on the bed and opened my phone. Every freaking message was about resistance.onion. Seems like everyone I had ever been in contact with was sending me a message about the same god darn website. That brings me to the present. I posted this on Reddit hoping someone out there knows what's going on and can tell me how to fix it. I don't know how much of this story will get through. I'm not sure what the rules are here for spreading this thing. Best I can tell it's some sort of virus. God help me I think I have a computer virus. I don't know how that's even possible, but I don't know how else to explain it. Seems to be extremely contagious. The phone to my room just rang. I didn't pick up. I'm scared to answer it. Please help and I'm so sorry. I have a tendency to get obsessed with something new for a short period of time before moving on to the next fix. A new game, a new hobby, etc. The dark web is something I've never been able to shake, something that's always had my curiosity. I don't know whether it's the secrecy of it or the fact I could have anything that I shouldn't, but after a recent experience it's something I wish I never got so obsessed with. One night, me and a friend, we'll call Hector, had a night without our girlfriends and took this time to have a well overdue catch up over some beers, everything was going well, it had been a while since we'd had a night like that with us both getting older. I don't know how, but the topic of my mentioned obsession, the dark web, had been brought up, with us having a fair few units of alcohol in our system. I decided to lift the lid of my laptop and load up the Tor browser and do some drunk exploring. I've only ever briefly explored the depths of the dark web once, maybe that's where my obsession stems from. We'd been searching for a good 30 minutes before we found one link that piqued our interest more than any other. It read, Make a Miserable Life. It's slightly worrying that we didn't hesitate to view this one, a site popped up, a very simple interface with the title at the top, a logo at the bottom and multiple text boxes in between, all of which were fields for someone's personal data. On the right was a short description of what they offer. It read as follows, wanting revenge? Wanting to see someone at their lowest? Everything they have ruined beyond belief. That's what we're here for surely, they can't do too much, was a thought I wish I never made. Probably due to the drunk courage, I decided it would be a funny idea to test this service with myself. I filled out my details and transferred the Bitcoin to make the payment cheaper than I expected. I now just had to wait and see what happened. I woke up the next day to my phone ringing, slightly hungover and still half asleep. I stretched to answer the phone for my boss. Hello? I answered slowly, it was rare my boss rang at all, let alone at 8 a.m. on the weekend. I'm sorry for this, but your actions from last night have led me to have to release you from your position. You need help. The phone ended, left confused and rather frustrated. 
I messaged Hector to see what happened. The message didn't go through. I tried to ring, straight to voicemail. Strange. I turn on the TV and make myself a coffee in hopes for some more energy. The news displays a headline, a male in their 20s is currently wanted by the CIA. Videos have emerged of the male, slowly torturing another male by the name Hector, as well as multiple little children. Taken aback, I take a step towards the TV. It flicks to a picture of the male. It was me, there, on the screen. A loud knock at the door took my gaze off the news. I peeked through my curtains to see almost hundreds of people, including who I thought were friends and family, holding posters wishing me dead with some of them armed with bricks. Not knowing what to do, I ran upstairs, petrified. I opened up my phone, the videos from the news everywhere, quite clearly showing me torturing my best friend, along with several children I have never seen in my life. An email comes through, it read, Thank you for using our service. The misery has been delivered. We hope you're satisfied with the results. I haven't left my house yet, and I know if I did, I wouldn't be given a chance to return. That's the last time I ever record my favorite obsession. Do you know that a person can survive without water for only three days, but Mahatma Gandhi was able to survive as much as 21 days without food? Those were things I used to know as a normal student in a small town. I know none of those things anymore. I just know about rage and feeling constantly hungry. I was in my last year of high school and working a part-time job so I could save money for higher education. Things were dull, but mostly fine until an otherwise normal afternoon after classes. It happened in the light of day. I was shoved inside a vehicle with expertise. I never saw the faces of the men that took me. I never saw their van stinking of old blood and rancid food. I could only see the blackness of my blind and taste the slight sweetness of chloroform before I lost my senses. When I woke up again, I was completely naked in a poorly lit room. The state I was in made me expect the worst, but there was no pain or bleeding indicating that kind of violence. It was cold, and there was a maddening dripping sound. Something was gleaming in the dark. As soon as I adjusted my eyes, I realized it was a knife. Drip, drip, drip. The small room had nothing but an already dirty toilet, the knife and a crack on the ceiling dripping slimy, slightly green water. The walls and floor were gray and featureless. A very strong light, like a camera flash, popped into my face, blinding all my senses with the shock. It disappeared after a moment, and I heard a voice. We want to watch your suicide. Let's see how long it will take. They took someone unremarkable, frail, with nothing to live for. But now I had a purpose. I had to frustrate my captors. If they wanted to watch my suicide, I would be the most resilient person in the world. I wouldn't grant their wish. Back then, I didn't know I was being watched by a bunch of sick and twisted people who kept up with my daily misery in the comfort of their houses and their anonymousness. I slept on the cold, hard floor, food never came, and the only source of water was the murky leak on the ceiling. I drank it, humiliated. It tasted worse than crap, and I would know that, since I fed on my own waste during the first few days. The only indication that a day had ended was the blinding flash and the same cold, mocking voice telling me that they were surprised I had made it so far. I was so hungry. So hungry. So hungry. The room was getting hotter from my breathing every day. There was no proper ventilation. It seemed to be just enough to not let me die from carbon monoxide poisoning, a merciful death compared to the one they planned for me. I didn't know why they chose me. I still don't know. I never wronged anyone. I never excelled at anything to be a target of one's envy. It was just a purposeless act of evil. The fact that it was completely random made my hatred grow and, with it, my determination. My stomach hurt beyond words. I was constantly sick from the putrid smells all around me. My body ached all over. My skin was matted and flaky, my hair falling from malnutrition. I grabbed the knife. I felt watched in cruel anticipation. Not today. I chopped off my left pinky and shoved it in my mouth before I could think too much about it. 
My own blood dripped on my chest as I chewed on my own bones. The crunching sound should be so sickening. My teeth should be hurting so much or even breaking, bone against bone. I should be horrified to phagocyte a part of my own body. But I was just so happy to be eating. After that, I felt my body growing stronger every day, like a member of the cannibal tribe in Papua New Guinea after ritualistically feeding on their departed loved ones. I laughed maniacally for hours at a time and trembled endlessly, but I was more alive than I've ever been in that captivity. I rationed my food slash body wisely. I needed my right hand, so it was crucial to spare at least four fingers on it, but I was free to feed on my left hand. My toes were pretty much useless, I've been dragging myself on the floor to move around anyway. But I didn't need to feed on myself for long. No more than a week after I first took a bite on myself, the voice after the blinding flash had something else to say. We are selling you. The official story is that I miraculously escaped my perpetrators during their flawed operation to move me to my new owner. And by the time I had reached a neighbor and the police were called, they had already fled the crime scene. The investigation was kept under extreme secrecy, so I didn't make the world news. Hell, I only made the local news as local teenager mutilated by unknown man. Someone even donated me a prosthetic hand. The police was able to take down the website where my daily torture was being streamed nonstop, and just then I found out that I was a star. I laughed for days because everyone felt so bad for me, not knowing that the torture I endured was way beyond losing a hand and a few toes. I laughed for days because I know the truth no one else does. I know how, right when they opened the door to my prison, my body felt like it was possessed by a bestial creature and, before I knew it, I used superhuman strength to crush the bones of five men all at once, then eat their fresh corpses whole. I even licked the leftover blood from the walls before I opened the doors and headed to the closest house, dragging my bad foot. In that moment, I felt like I was the co-pilot of my body, the wheelsman was a voice screaming kill and devour. I could never escape if something hasn't taken hold of me, I'm not strong or even fast. I'd do anything to spend the rest of my life quietly, having my body and mind slowly heal and recover from a devastating trauma. The problem is that eating the raw flesh of my captors was the most pleasant experience I've ever had in my life. And, while I've been chasing mercilessly all the monsters that watched my suffering for their own enjoyment, I'm too hungry. The tainted flesh has not been enough for me, no, for us. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Daniel, I'll withhold my surnames, as I would like to retain a sliver of that illusion called privacy. I am writing this under a crushing amount of psychological stress and enjoying the placid stupor of my prescription drug and anxiolytic to regulate high levels of anxiety, yet I assure you, I am as lucid as I have ever and will ever be. I wish I could forget what I am about to narrate, yet there is no nepenthe that could erase the things I have seen, what I know. I shall relate my experiences as a naive explorer of the deep web to the best of my ability. To commence, I would like to give you insight as to what this deep web is. Imagine an iceberg, the most massive pile of buoyant ice you can conjure. That is the internet. As you know by the age-old adage, the tip of the iceberg is the portion we can easily see. In this context, the upper web is what we can see on our daily lives. Google, Facebook, YouTube, Ucorn, this very Reddit we are on right now. As Mufasa would put it, everything the light touches, our kingdom of information and socialization. But what about that shadowy place, asks a young Simba. The bottom of the iceberg, that which remains unseen, is the deep web, and in a manner akin to an actual iceberg, it comprises up to an esteemed 96% of the whole expanse of the internet. This deep web contains the websites not indexed by search engines such as Google or Yahoo, not even Bing, and as such, they remain hidden beneath the water. And just as Mufasa replied, that is beyond our borders, you must never go there. And what did Simba do? The very same stupid, foolish, unforgivable thing I did. He disregarded the warnings. I heard about the deep web from an acquaintance of mine, a fellow who studies computer engineering and, as such, has contact with codes and networks and other such amenities. 
At first I disregarded his claims about the existence of this deep web, and how could I not? Impossible, methought, that such a vast repository of information and interaction could lie hidden beneath our noses. Ludicrous. And, for the record, yes, this is the way I think and speak in English, as it is not my mother language. They know, and so do you have the right to know. At the time it appeared to me as a thing of legend, a vast reservoir of knowledge and arcane lore the likes of which could be found in lost Alexandria or the ransacked libraries of Baghdad. The mere idea that such an inconceivable ocean of data and esteemed eight flaming petabytes existing in our world seemed beyond fantastic. Like a fool, I was seduced by the idea of seeing this occult side of the internet. Swayed and tutored by my acquaintance in the ways to access the deep web, ways that for your safety I shall not, and I repeat, shall not describe, so please don't inquire about them feeling safe and sound within the sanctum of my living quarters. I clicked on the executable program that would link me with this gallery of knowledge. Admittedly, at the time I felt like the one after having chosen the red pill, about to embark in a journey through untrodden pathways of information, I felt akin to an explorer akin to Columbus, a scientist on par with Darwin as he voyaged across the Galapagos Islands in the search for wisdom. Perhaps if my mind had been made of sterner stuff I could have withstood what I came to learn. And so I entered into the realm beyond the light. At first it was a grossly underwhelming, anticlimactic sight to behold. The hell is this? I intoned, as I was greeted by a blank page stating I had entered correctly. Was this the oh-so-famous deep web? A blank page with less flair than the 90s GIF fests of yore? I found myself feeling an abject disappointment. My thoughts of unknown secrets, adventure, and discovery had toppled to the ground. Now I wish I had left them there, never to be picked up. My acquaintance sent me a link, eloquently titled The Hidden Wiki. Within, I found a list of links categorized in a wide array of topics. You could find links to purchase weapons and drugs in the black market, to arrange shady meetings, and of course, corn, much like life in the universe, on the internet. Corn always finds a way. Suffice to say my appetite had been whetted, and I hungered, lusted, for more. As I was relating, I ventured forth into the deep web in the search for hidden gems of knowledge. And I did learn a lot. There's a huge, expansive black market for weapons, drugs, explosives, and any illegal thing you may imagine. Exotic creatures abound and are sold at quite reasonable prices. If you consider $10,000 reasonable for a Siberian tiger, that is. Counterfeit money was sold on a rate of 2 colon 1, and PayPal accounts containing up to $100,000 sold for a fraction of their purported value. It appeared to me as a veritable rosebud cheat, only in real life. Fantastic, me thought, Alon's why, quoth I. Of course, inquisition and discovery, a lapse is necessary. And what better way to regain energy and confidence than to ogle some fine pornography? What can I say? I am but a man. Intrigued by the possibilities of what I could find, I ventured into the erotica section of the hidden wiki. What first stood out to me was a link titled Pink Myth, a quaint name, but seemingly fitting for the purpose, thought I. At first sight it seemed to be your standard corn site, pictures of girls neatly arranged in rows, without a specific order to them, some of them scantily clad, others perfectly in the nude. Nothing unusual up to this point, merely another page that offered amateur corn. But then I noticed a curious link beneath each picture, the name of the lady in question and, attached to it, a Facebook profile. The hell! I exclaimed as the blue letters took me to a Facebook page, her name, address, friends, family, IP, everything had been laid out before me. This admittedly distressed me. The information I had access to could positively ruin a young lady's life. Not only that, it could be used for other purposes. Suddenly the jokes about how stalking is much easier thanks to Facebook took on a much sinister meaning. In fairness, she should not have published those pictures of herself on the internet. Countering that argument, however, maybe she did not. Perhaps it was a spiteful boyfriend or someone hacked her PC or something of such nature. I knew not, and it was not something I wished to know the reason for. I left the site feeling a trifle shaken. Poor girl, said I, and I meant it. No one should be subject to that, let alone that exposed in her personal information. 